And it's great to see you today. I'm so glad you're here. You've, you've seen, we're asking a lot of questions. If you're new today, I've met some first timers here. We're glad you're here today. We hope you already feel welcome. Uh, but we are asking a lot of questions about God. We said, is he real? Is he, a couple weeks ago, is he exclusive? Um, today we're going to ask, we're asking the question, is he inclusive? And do those things, are they contradictory? Can he be both? Uh, we're going to talk a lot about that. This word inclusion is kind of a trigger word in our culture today, uh, particularly as it relates to LGBT, you know, issues and such. But we're going we're gonna to talk about that a little bit. I'm not going to be real explicit. So parents, we want to leave a lot of that for you at, in, in your home to talk about. It's hard to talk about uh, these issues, but we, we need to be clear. Some of you saw even this week, some that's happening like in the Methodist church and others, and people are wondering, where are we? Where do we stand? Are we, are we inclusive, exclusive? Are we, are we affirming? Are we ex- accepting? All those things, lots of questions around that. Um, and we've got resources. We're going to send you some resources, parents, to help you talk to your kids about that once they're old enough to do so, okay? Um, and it's younger and younger all the time, unfortunately, in our, in our culture today. But we want to be included, don't we? This starts when we're really young. Whether it's like on, on the playground, you want to be included with a certain group of friends. Um, generally, when you're a kid, uh, you're a kid, I'm a kid. We're best friends. Let's play. You know, something happens when we grow up, we start to draw lines, don't we? And categories, and, and we, we tend to do that. But uh, gosh, it's not just in middle school or high school that we want to be included, college. Um, a lot of us want to be included at work. We want to be in that group. I want to be invited to that party. I'm not with that group. I don't feel like I'm on the inside. I want to be considered for that position. I've been rejected uh, from that role in my firm. And we, we deal with this all the time. I remember when I was in, in middle school, I think I was like seventh grade, eighth grade, and I had this, this shirt that had big squares on it, like I would call it Carolina blue and white um, checkered on it. And, and I had this, uh, and I was getting ready for a dance. I'm going to a dance, like seventh, eighth grade. And uh, I had this jacket. I'm not even sure where I got this, but I had this jacket that was kind of velvet, dark blue velvet jacket. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I was, I, was, I, was, I was looking fly. I don't mind telling you. I was looking. I, I thought, this looks great. Like, this is going to be awesome. I wanted to be cool, right? And I had this one girl. I wanted to ask her to maybe, like, dance with me or something along the way, um, you know, and, and just and try that. And I had this, I had this y'all, sorry. I had this Dutch boy haircut. And um, I, I mean, and even my mom, though, I was heading out, and mom was even... And again, I don't even know, like, did you buy me that? I'm like, where did, but my mom was even like, are you, you're gonna, you sure you wanna wear, like, you're gonna wear that to the dance? And I was like, yeah, I mean, look at me. I mean, amazing. <laughs> um, uh, and so I look, you know, you look back and I, I've seen pictures of, uh, I'm like, what was I thinking? And even there, it's like, why didn't my parents, why didn't y'all guide me, like, with truth and love? Um, but we do crazy things to try to be included. And if we all were to tell stories, and now as our graduates are, are, you know, stepping into the room, we look back in high school, maybe it was for you, maybe it was in college, we do crazy things to be included. Why is that? We want to be affirmed, we want to be accepted, we want to be loved. That's what it is in the end. Today we're going to celebrate the fact before we're done, or throughout, how about that? We've already been doing it. Jesus did a crazy thing for you to be included in the family of God. And we're going to look at a passage of scripture from a wise, older, uh, loving uh, Christian leader in the first, uh, first century church. And we find his letters in uh, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. Turn to 1st John 3. If you have your Bible, okay, everybody grab your Bible. I know we make this really easy. I wrestle with this. I'll wrestle with it out loud. We got the screen. Here it is. Scripture, all the things. It's up there. We, my concern is that we create um, some lazy listeners. Let's do this. As we dive into God's word, now be a good time to pause. We've got a lot of people who are standing back there who need a seat. We've got a lot of seats down here that y'all can sit in. And these are really nice people right down here. Really kind. I know these people. Uh, we got seats over here. So come on in um, because I know y'all have been a part of something else. It's not like you're just arriving. Others of us have just arrived. But not y'all. Y'all been here a while. And so we got seats. Okay. Don't leave is what I'm trying to say. Oh, good. We got chairs. Okay, chairs are coming. Because who wants to sit in, in the front, right? <laughs> I always say it in, in, our, in a Baptist church, especially. I don't know. It's true everywhere. If you, if you want to 
If you want to sit in the back, you got to get here early. <laughs> I'm just saying, that's how it goes. Lovingly rebuke some of y'all. All right, so we're diving this. Y'all ready for this? Let's go. First John, first John is where we are. First John chapter three. And again, this passage is, uh, this is a great one. This passage is from, a, from John the apostle. Okay, he's a little older now. And we're going to see, he's just parroting his Savior. That's all he's doing. Uh, that's all Paul does. They just, you know, we heard this. John was like his beloved. He knew something about the love of God, the love of Jesus in his life. It transformed his life. And so uh, we're going to ask three questions. We've been asking all these questions. I'm going to ask you three questions, all right? Because our graduates are so whipping smart, they'll know the answers before it all begins. But here's the thing. Why is inclusion, as we talk about this word, why is inclusion a problem? Now, you didn't come to church thinking, why well, is inclusion a problem? I hope the pastor deals with that today. But it, it's in our culture, right? Those who want to be included or not, or am I included, am I not? And, and, and in what ways am I included? Why is it a problem? Why is it an issue and something we wrestle with? How is it even possible? How is inclusion possible in the family of God? How does that even work? And then how is it proven in the end? How, and that question really is, how can I, this is worth thinking about, how can, how can it be proven that someone is in the family of God, that I am included? Can that be proven? Can we know for sure? And that's really what this passage is about in so many ways. So let's jump in. It's, uh, it starts with verse, uh, verse seven. You'll see it here. He says, dear children, he uses this term seven times or an endearing term that he's using to say, dear children, Jesus does this for the disciples at a point. I think it's uh, John John 21, somewhere in there. It's, he says, okay, boys, hey, hey, boys, listen, children, do not let anyone lead you astray. So this early church was like we are and being misguided by false teaching, and he's drawing them back, and he says, don't, don't, be, don't let anybody deceive you. The one who does what is right is righteous. Now, that might, you might read that and go, well, of course you do, right? You're righteous. This word righteous is the word just as well. It's interchangeable. And just, just about. And so those who are just, those who do right by others, that's a really good way to say it. Those who are righteous, the one who does what is sinful is of the devil. Now he throws the devil in here. We don't use that. We don't even talk about the devil often. You're either of God or you're of the devil. This is what he's saying. Because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. Jesus shows up, shows us another way. Okay? So why is inclusion a problem? The Apostle John says it's a problem because there are two camps of people. There's two tribes. And we, we need to understand this. He's, again, he's just parroting Jesus. In John 8, he's talking to religious leaders. Jesus was. And he says, if you were of my father, you would understand what I'm talking about here. Instead, you're of the devil. What? You, the devil is your father. Jesus, I mean savage Jesus. He's talking to religious leaders. And he says, your father's the devil. This is why you don't fully understand what I'm saying here. My father is God. And this is what uh, the, the apostle John is saying. He says, you're either of the devil or you're of God. And we need to make no mistake about that. And the, and the language there is those who, I think King James, other places say, those who practice righteousness. This is, that's worth noting. Those who stay in sin and practice unrighteousness are of the devil. Those who practice righteousness are of the Lord. Now, this is, is such a problem because often in our culture, we've talked about this a lot, in a secular, pluralistic, um, relativistic culture, all right, and, and college students heading out, graduates, watch for it. On your campus, and we're seeing it across, across the, the board even now, um, where there is no truth, all right, that anybody's truth is good. Your truth is just as valid as my truth. Your lifestyle is just as valid as anybody else's. Your religion, same as everybody else's. If you've never studied the, the comparative you know, religions, you, you, you wouldn't, wouldn't know it necessarily. If you have, religions and their belief are radically different from one another. And Christianity is radically different from all other religions in the world. So there is truth and there's not truth. But we often step even on a college campus, and you're gonna you're gonna be faced with this: that uh, hey, it's it's your truth up against my truth, and what we what we run into then isn't it true? 
that if you disagree with me, then in our culture, where inclusion, think about it, if there is no truth, everybody's truth is of equal value, and there's no ultimate truth from God, then everybody's on equal, equal footing. And so anyone who comes against me and says there's truth, that I might be wrong, that's unloving. And we all have experienced this to some degree. And we wrestle with this because we know there is truth. But here's the thing we need to remember. Our God, Jesus, was full of grace and what? Full of truth. Not, he's half and half. He's full of grace, fully, fully loving, full of truth. Now, we don't all do this well. In fact, I've learned through the years, we all lean one way or the other. Some people are like, give me more grace, give me more grace. In fact, a lot of grace, a lot of grace, a lot of grace, a lot of God is loving, God is love, love is love, love is love, love. Just love. The others, other, others are like, no, 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 there's truth. Speak the truth. Got to speak the, come on, there is truth. And there is truth. There's that which is real and that which is not real. There is that which is of God and of the devil. There is practicing righteousness and practicing unrighteousness. Two different camps. And what happens is truth without grace, you see, can sound rigid, dogmatic, even seem unloving. But is it? Every parent here knows that's not the case. You have to speak truth for the flourishing of, of your children, of your family, everybody around you. None of us want to be told what to do, particularly when it runs against my own desires and preferences. Don't tell me how I must live my life. It runs contrary to what I desire. When we come to faith in Christ, we are saying, I am bowing before the Lord Jesus. He's the one who has died on the cross for me. He lived the perfect life for me. My response out of his love for me is to love him, and that means I'm going to obey him. Everyone is invited, everyone's included to lay your preferences and your desires and your will before God. He is Lord. And when my will, your will, our desires don't match up with him and his word, then we need to align. Why? Because he's full of love for us. And he wants us to flourish. And young people, graduates, you need to remember this. That as we seek uh, the Lord, he's full of grace, but he's full of truth. And his truth comes to us out of his loving heart. All of his negative commands are out of a heart of love to say yes to us. Yes to protect us. Yes to provide something better. So we want peace, but we don't want it in obedience to him, and it's not going to happen. We want to experience uh, blessings from God, but we don't want to follow the preconditions of blessing, which are to align our lives up with his word and who Jesus is. Because, you see, be, living a righteous life is not just living like being good behavior. It's not just good conduct. Living a righteous life is to respond to his grace to become like Jesus. He's the righteous one. So what, how do you know if someone's in or someone's out? If someone's in, they continue to practice righteousness. It's proof. If they're out, they are practicing unrighteousness, regardless of what they say. They might say they're in. Oh, I'm in. I believe all this. And not live like Jesus at all. And so creating questions already in our minds, well, how do you know? Am I in? Or that loved one I have, is he in or out? Or is she in? I don't know. We, we, see, we want hope, but we don't want, it, we, we, we don't want Jesus to be the one that's our central, central form or source of hope. We, we want purpose in life, but we don't want tell God telling us what the purpose is. And then guiding us with clarity into what that would look like for each one of us. So inclusion is a problem because we're a problem. <laughs> Inclusion is a problem because we're broken. All of us are, are broken and sinful, and we need to align our lives up with God. So how is inclusion even possible? And I'm going to spend some time here on this, and this is a good sermon for all of our seniors. I'm going to talk about, I'm going to go, I'm going to go there. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the LGBTQ community here. And again, parents, we're going to offer resources for you. Um, and I want you to unpack this at home, regardless of how old your kids are. Because this, this needs to be talked about. And, um, and, and I'm, again, I'm not going to be real explicit here, but I want to, to talk about this because it's so important. Uh, but look at what he says. How is inclusion possible? Let's get there. Um, at the end of verse 8, it says this. 
The reason, is there a reason for hope? Is there a reason that we should be hopeful that I'm going to live a righteous life? The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. He came to destroy the devil's works. No one who is born of God will continue in sin. Now, do we, does a Christian stop sinning someday? Not on this side of eternity. But when we commit ourselves to him and to holiness, we become more and more like him all the time. That's what the Christian life is all about, right? But if you continue in sin, then look at this. Here's, here's what he says. Because God's seed remains in them. No one who has come to faith in Christ is going to continue to practice unrighteousness. Again, that doesn't mean we become perfect, but look at this. There's a seed that's been planted in you as a believer. And like any seed, it can't help but grow now. It can't help but grow. Now you can say, well, wait, if it's watered, it'll grow. If you're in good soil, it'll grow. And Jesus taught, taught us a lot about that. But how do you know if you're in? Well, you continue in righteousness. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. Those who are born of God will continue to pursue him. There's a motivational shift that takes place in your life, and you can't help but grow if you're in Christ. Now, is it possible that you drift out of fellowship? Yes. Your relationship will never change. He's got you. And here's what I've told our seniors. I've talked to a group of, of graduates and parents. We always say this, and, and I'll say it to all of our seniors today. Um, the first thing you need to do before you get on to your campus, your college campus, wherever that might be, um, you need to find the church you're going to be a part of the first Sunday you're there. Determine now you're going to be there. Because somebody's going to have an idea Saturday night about what you ought to be doing. I mean, there's going to be an idea. There's going to be some text. There's going to be a group. But you're going to church that day, and you can know. We can help you, too, to know where you're going to go. Because my, my thing is, we've got to do this in community. You've got to find other believers who are with you. Because you're going to be challenged and faced with a lot. In verse 10, he says this. This is how we know that we are children of God or who they are. And who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child. Now that's broad. But again, who's not righteous, okay? Pursuing Christ and living like him. Nor is anyone who does not love their brother or sister. So in the end, the, the proof is love. And that love looks like a life that looks like Jesus. Are you constantly growing to look like Jesus? And do people around you who claim to be a part of the family, are they growing in the Lord? Have they bowed to the lordship of Jesus? That's what it is. But without a baseline of truth, here's what happens in our culture today. And our students will face this in maybe new ways. But this word inclusive has been hijacked by, by our culture. It's like a lot of words. And it's created, it's forcing Christians into this bifurcated uh, false dichotomy, which is this. I've already referenced it. If you disagree with me, you're unloving. That is not the way this plays out because we all know, no, you can be loving and you can disagree with someone. And we, we all know this. And, and, and yet what happens is it seems to put people on a defensive. And I know that we have a lot of people here who are wrestling with, whether it be family members or your own um, desires. And I want to really center in on something here to explain it. And I want to explain it this way. We are radically devoted to two things. Our church, any church that is a biblical, biblically functioning church is going to be devoted to two things. We are radically devoted to holiness and we are radically devoted to hospitality. And I want to, I want to parse these out. We're radically devoted to holiness. Holiness is to become like Jesus. That's what it looks like. We say it this way. Perfect theology is embodied in the person of Jesus. So after we receive his grace, he says, okay, uh, anyone, there's inclusion, anyone who wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, herself. Okay, so, I mean, think about this. Deny yourself, take up your cross. What's he talking about? That only meant one thing, die. Wait, like die to my desire? Yes. Die to my preference? Yes. Die to the things I want to do in my life? Yes. Because you now die, offer your identities, offer your idols to me, and let me be Lord of your life, and I will guide you. Yeah, but what if my desires don't match up with, with your word? Yep, that's hard. You can choose that, or you can choose me. And we all wrestle with this. 
Holiness, a devotion to holiness is what we call sanctification. There's the word, sanctus, literally, to become holy. And if you hadn't thought about this lately, to be a Christian is not simply to identify as a Christian. We've said it this way. It's possible in our culture today to identify, self-identify as a Christian and not be a disciple of Jesus. There's no such thing. Jesus only called disciples. And he said, if you want to follow me, die to yourself, die to all of your desires, and let me form you and shape you into the person that I've created you to be because that's where the flourishing is, not in a way that doesn't align with Scripture. It's out of his love that he tells us this, right? And it's hard, isn't it? Oh, die to myself. Like, you mean every day? Yeah, that's why I say daily. Yeah, every day. Die to yourself daily and follow me. We've got to believe that his word is true and following him in that way is how we're going to flourish in life. Because think about this. God himself is holy, right? It means, by definition, holy means, holy means set apart. You might know that. It means consecrated. So he's not just holy like one of his attributes. He's holy and he's loving and he's merciful. No, he's set apart holy in all of his attributes. He is, how about this? Because say it this way. God is exclusive in and of himself. There's nobody like him. There's no other gods, so-called gods, that are anything like him. He's holy. He's completely other. And he calls us then to live lives that are set apart, that are holy. Why? For our good, yes, and to his glory, meaning others see him in us. And here's what we do. I know we often, I want to go here. We often categorize certain sins, right? And we think about inclusion. It's a buzzword, particularly as it relates to, to human sexuality. And so um, we categorize sins. And I just want to say it up front. Um, the Bible talks about being sexually pure. In the New Testament, there's this word pornea. There, there's fornication, which is, which is and pornea is, is sex outside of marriage. It's before, and while, in, while married, uh, apart from your, your spouse, and, and after marriage. It's, it's, it's something that's talked about, and we're all called to sexual purity and holiness. Okay, so I'm just going to focus in on this for a minute. Um, and yet, we're all, can we say it? We're all, we're all sexually broken. No one has followed the commands of God uh, in a way where we can be prideful and say, well, I'm, I'm not. You know, again, I don't sin like that person. I mean, we categorize sin. I might sin this way, but I don't do that. And too often, we come then with a judgmental, condemning spirit, right? Jesus up the ante in the Sermon on the Mount, which we're going to look at this fall, and he says, hey, even if you lust in your heart, you've committed adultery. What? See, we've all, we're all on the same, same level. I was talking this week, uh, gosh, past two weeks, I talked to a friend uh, here in Dallas, two, two friends, both in ministry, both have, have wrestled with um, same-sex attraction. And so to sit and talk with them as friends, it just so happened that it was the past couple of weeks prior to this message. And we talked about um, what it's like, you know. Both are devoted to, to a Christian ethic, biblical ethic of sexuality, okay? I don't know if that blows your categories or something, um, but, but it's, it's B-side. It's, it's called, you know, B-side, where you're actually devoted to the Word of God and committed to His plan for our, our, our purpose in, in terms of our male and femaleness, okay? And uh, one of my friends is married with three kids. And you can imagine they've had to wrestle through a lot. Some of you know this, where there's, um, it's called a mixed orientation marriage, where you find out later maybe that a spouse is, is gay or, or something like that. And, and Christian couples and others have had to sort through that and, and still in. And, and because I love you not as a, as a sexual object, I love you as a holistic person. That's a beautiful thing. And so we, we see that there's a lot that we could talk about here, and, and I don't want to get all in the weeds, but... My point is this, and all of us are, are, are sharing this today. We want to be real clear, Travis, Rolando, Rolando, myself, because one aspect of holiness is this Christian uh, vision of, of human sexuality, and we all need to hear this and learn this from an early age. And so here's how I want to say it. I want you to look at this. We hold to, all right, the orthodox, historical, traditional, biblical vision of human sexuality. I'm using all those words because they're all true. Always been the case, whether Catholic, Protestant, whatever else, 
orthodox historical tradition, biblical vision of human sexuality, which means, students, listen up. God has created us male and female. He has created us to have sexual intimacy within marriage, which is only between a man and a woman biblically. And I know our, the, the law can say otherwise. But, but the Bible says that marriage is between one man and one woman devoted to one another in covenant relationship for life. And for some of us who have family members or maybe we're, we're wrestling with it ourselves, this is hard. This is that truth and grace piece that is so hard because, yes, we love people who wrestle. Again, all of us, we love people who wrestle to be uh, holy and to live pure and holy lives. We love, we love one another. And because we love one another, we want to challenge each other. Uh, you know, it's been said, um, we've talked about it this way. Uh, yeah, love the sin or hate the sin. And I, I like to say, no, hate your own sin. Start there. I mean, Jesus said that, right? You got a log in your eye. Are you kidding me? You're going to point out the speck in another? And, and, and so he, he tells us, listen, hate your own sin. Because here's what we need to see. A devotion to holiness is what he's called us to. And I just want to say this to all of our single friends here. Um, Jesus was a single man. <laughs> and he lived a pure and holy life before the Father. Perfect. And so, you know, we, I know single people can often think, you know, man, if I, if I just got married, then I could live out my sexuality or something, you know. No, no, no. Single, young, old, married. We can all align our lives with the holiness of God and the, and the calling that he's placed on us. Because some of us, we have habits. Some of us are addicted. Whether it be the pornography, whether it be, you know, hooking up or whatever it might be. People wrestle with this. And just, and, but Jesus, again, he said, lust in your heart. We, we're all in, in need. So we come humbly before God and say, Lord, help me to keep fighting. But we fight together. We've got to fight together. And in homes where we're, where we're taught and we're guided toward the Lord in holiness. And we model this. And we need friends to help us get there. But here's what, here's what I want to say. We're, you know, some of us are like, amen, amen, and amen. But we're also radically devoted to hospitality. And here's what I mean. The church... Okay, the church is a hospital. You've heard this for sinners. It's, it's not a museum for saints. It's a hospital. You see the word hospitality, hospital. We all are broken and in need of hospital to heal us, and we do it together. It's why you're 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 here today. We're and if I'm if I'm the doctor, okay. My 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 daughter Whitney back in the day had a, had a teacher say, "I heard your your father's a doctor," and she said, "Yeah, but not the kind that helped." people. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to help today. We're here at the hospital and it's truth that heals us. And it's aligning our lives up with truth that allows us to flourish. Okay. So we are committed to holiness. You got that right. But we are committed to hospitality. And this is the part that should make some of us uncomfortable if I say it right. Everyone is invited to join us on this journey Keep coming, you know, be a part of this. Here's what our same sex attracted friends need. You know what they need? Friends. They need friends. They, those who are devoted or not, but those who are devoted to a Christian, biblical, orthodox, sexual ethic, they need friends. They don't need to go to another community or place to find people who will accept them. They need people who just love them in and say, join us. Everyone's invited. Lay down your identities. Lay down your preferences. Lay down your, your life and pursue Jesus and become holy with us. That's what we're all about. That's what the church is about. We don't, we don't toss out the truth of God's word. We can't. We, we don't toss out grace. So how is inclusion even possible? Again, here it is. Verse 8. The reason that it's possible. The Son of God appeared. He, he came so that he would destroy the devil's works. 
You might think, man, I have been wrestling with sin or I am far in. I, my life is not, is on a trajectory away from his, his, his call on my life. Is it possible? Yes, it's possible. Only by the power of his spirit. And only by having others in your life that will speak the truth to you and not simply let you drift off into a way that's not in alignment with the scriptures. And so what we can say is this, with all of us who are, and this is, I know, hard, tender to hear this message. All of us who wrestle, I know if we're honest, all of us are struggling, and, and some of us who really are addicted to porn or to, to whatever, we, we find ourselves in, in trouble. And you, and you might say, I don't know, I don't know if I'll ever, ever get over this. I don't know if I'll ever become who I want to be. Or maybe I've, I've, gone, I've got so much in my past. Maybe, sure enough, it's adulterous relationships. It's things that we've done. We have, we have sexual shame and, and such in our lives. How can I ever pull out of this? Here's what you, you cannot say. You cannot say that Jesus just turned his back and said, no big deal. You know, that's, that's not a big thing. Not, I'm, not, I'm not even gonna, nope. I don't even wanna know about that. Uh, you cannot say that. He addressed our sin straight on. He came and lived the perfect life for us because we couldn't so that he would be our substitute. He died on the cross for all of our sin across the board, because there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. Listen, self-condemnation needs to end in your life. If you're in Christ, you've been set free. But we need to get honest about a lot of this, and we need to come before other brothers and sisters and say, I'm wrestling with it, I'm struggling. And this is a place where you can do that. He died on the cross for your sin. And as we set up now the Lord's Supper together, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13, it says this, but now, everybody say now. now. Oh my goodness. Right now, in Christ, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. How many of you have been brought near by the blood of Christ? Anybody here? Received his grace, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both and has broken. Okay, the different, okay, righteous, unrighteous, all the different groups, all the people were all brought together. He's broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility between all of us. He has brought us together. And so if we are in Christ, we are one in the spirit. And he says that we have come together. We can love one another. Why? Because he loves us. And if this, if this is true, if he loves us, then let us love one another, okay? Let us love one another. And here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna pray, and then we're going to, yes, our seniors, our graduates are gonna serve us. What a blessing. Let's pray together. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And now our, our, as our graduates uh, serve us in a moment, um, we're gonna be the church. They're, they're leading the way for us today. They're servant leaders for us today. And as we do, we're gonna sing together. We're gonna... Uh, just acknowledge the fact that because he loves us, we can love one another. And loving one another means that we speak the truth in love. That we're full of grace, but we are also full of truth because his commands are given to us out of his great love for us. Lord, we are a broken people. We have desires that are mixed up and and we need to just come before you again and say thank you. Thank you for giving us your word. It's hard to follow. Thank you for giving us the power by your spirit to overcome. Thank you that your way is better. You really are better. You're better whether young or old or single or married or whatever. Lord, you're better. So we lay our lives before you. And again today, we just lay our idols, our identities before you. We claim the one true identity. We are sons and daughters of the beloved King Jesus. And if you love us, and we know you love us, let us love one another. As we remember now how you love us. In Jesus' name we pray. So... I'm going to wrap this up. I've got a short third, third, third point of the message. How is inclusion even proven? We've talked about it. The song led us there. 
Uh, but in the latter part of this, there's two verses left, and he says this, for this is the message that you've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Love is the proof. And again, love is truth and grace, right? We should not be like Cain. This is interesting, a throwback to way back at the beginning, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. He's saying, this has been a challenge all the while. Cain wanted to be included, but on his own terms. Why did he murder his brother Abel? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. So he was of one camp. Abel was of another. And friends, listen, Jesus said this. It's a strange thing. If you live a righteous life of holiness, you're going to be persecuted. And more and more in our culture, we see it around the world and other cultures, you're going to be hated. That's a bizarre thing when it's like we're just, we're just here to love. But love with truth because truth is what heals and truth is what sets us free is what Jesus says. So we must present the truth. We must live in truth and live holy lives because welcoming people into our lives and our fellowship Proves that we love them. Proves we love them. Now, you can say, well, you know, this is, okay, that's where the church stands. This is good to hear. I mean, you don't want to be in a church that speaks truth and grace and all the things. But here's what you could do. You could, you could include someone at your dinner table. You can include someone and, and just get to know their story. You can include someone over coffee that you know is different from you and maybe not included. Or maybe they don't feel included. Again, if they're, like we've talked about today, many feel like they're not included in the family of God because some Christians have not lived with grace to say, hey, join me on this journey to holiness. And, and so we, we invite others to come in because we're all a bunch of canes who offer um, sacrifices that are not, not perfect. Jesus comes, he's the better able, and he offers himself to set us free. So in the end, proof of it all is love. Jesus, a friend of sinners, showed us how, how to live, okay?